We're in a series called The Cost. The Cost. We're talking about what it means to fully follow Jesus Christ. What it means to fully follow Jesus Christ. And, And Jesus encouraged the idea, before you buy something, before you get involved in something, before you start out on a journey, ask how much it's going to cost. Now, I just want to ask a question this morning, and I want, I want you to be really honest with me. How many of you, when you hear the cost of something, you're prone to want to haggle a little bit? Raise them up high. Can I say, I want to see all the hagglers here. You're just, you're not satisfied with that first price, you know. You know, I can get them down just a little bit, you know. So you say, well, what's the least you would take for that, right? You're hagglers. How many of you are like me? You are terrible Hagglers, You just can't bargain anything at all. I'm awful at that. When people start trying to make a deal, or if, especially if I'm selling something, people say, will you take that? I'm like, yeah, just take it. Just go. Just leave me alone. Let's make this transaction over with. Leave me alone. I hate to haggle about things. But there are people who are good at it. They love to haggle. I'll never forget the first time I went with my dad to, to purchase a car. I sat in the office with him, and I don't know if they still do it this way. Uh, car dealers offer no haggle prices. And that's what I like. I don't want to debate it. I don't want to fight about it. I don't want to talk about it too much. Let's just tell me what you'll take, and and I'll say yes or no, and I'm out of here. My dad went in, and this is how they did it back then. This was a long time ago. Dad uh, looked at the car and said, well, I like it. Well, Mr. Craver, the guy said, how much will you take? So dad had a little piece of paper. You ever seen this done this way? He wrote down a price on a piece of paper and just slid it across the desk. And then the guy looked at it and said, oh, Mr. Craver, now we just can't let it go for that. So he took out his pen and just wrote down a price and slid it back. I still don't know what that's all about. Why can't you just say it out loud? Is there something, do you, do you lose power by speaking it out loud? Does the, does the paper give you some sort of power in negotiation? And Dad was like, um, no, no, we'll work on it a little bit. And he wrote down a price and he slid it back across the desk and we didn't wind up buying that car, <laughs> just so you'll know. I thought we could do something kind of fun today. We're talking about the cost of following Jesus, so I thought we could just negotiate with God a little bit and see if we can get his price down a little bit. You want to try that with me today? I guess you can leave then if you don't want to do that, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it today, so we're going to see what God's price is. We're going to haggle with him a little bit and and try to get the price down a little bit. So you've got a sheet of paper today, and this is your haggle sheet with God. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I guess it is here today. This is your sheet to make a deal with God, and you might want to get out a pen. You don't have to do this, but this is fun. Uh, You can get out a pen, and you may want to write down some some people folding it up already. Okay. Um, we're going to make a deal with God and just see if he will come to come our direction a little bit on, on our terms, you know. We'll, let's see if we can serve him on, on some of our terms a little bit better. There's a, there's a young man in Scripture who tried to do exactly that. He tried to negotiate with God. And I don't know about you, some of you acted so holy when I said let's negotiate with God that obviously you've never done that. The rest of us down here on normal planet Earth, we've tried this before, and I'll just bet you have too. Like this, God, if you'll get me out of this, I will fill in the blank. God, if you'll just let me survive this, I promise I'm going to start going to church. God, if this girl will just date me, I promise that we will go to church together, Lord. You know, we try to haggle with God. That's just the honest truth. We try to negotiate with God. We say things like, okay, God, I want to serve you, but, you know, is that really a sin? I have people come to me all the time saying, preacher, is this a sin or not? And, And I often say to them, what is it you're after? Are you trying to just live as close to the line as possible? Are you trying just to barely slip into heaven uh, just just get in but live as close as you people we try to neg- I've done it too can we just be honest I've done it you've done it what's the least I can pay for this relationship God what's the least amount I can sacrifice in order to gain eternal life 
You got this young man who came to Jesus in Sunday school. We called him the rich young ruler. He's a young, successful, really moral young man. He comes to Jesus. He's the kind of guy who, who everybody wants to be like, you know. The girls want to date him. The guys want to be like him. He comes running to Jesus, not walking to Jesus. He comes running to Jesus. You can see it in Mark 10, 17. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, we talked about this last week, Why do you call me good, Jesus asked, only God is truly good. And we talked about this last week, how the cost of discipleship, it costs you all your preconceptions about Jesus Christ. You can't just call him good teacher. You've got to acknowledge who he is, for he claimed to be the Son of God. So he said, what, what must I, what's that word there? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How can I earn this? What kind of works must I do? Now, now the young man had all kinds of things going for him, but obviously, even with his morality, even with his wealth, even with his social standing, even with you know, all that he had. He was, a, he was a big man in the community. Some of the Gospels actually suggest, and some scholars suggest, he was a religious man, possibly even a, a leader in, in Judaism, in the synagogue. He could have been a leader. With all this, he still had a lack in his life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That sometimes you can achieve something or, or get a promotion or buy something and you get it and you think, man, this is so good, but still something down inside of you is gnawing that it's just not enough. There's got to be something more here. So the young man's feeling that feeling that we've all had before, and he comes running to Jesus, and, and the first thing out of his mouth is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As if you can do something to earn God's favor. God, if I can just, just you know, uh, I'm going to tell you the things I'm willing to give up for you. I'm going to tell you the places I'm willing to go. I'm going to tell you the people I'm willing to, to minister to. I'm going to tell you the things that I'm willing to stop doing. And if I get this list of things right, then you will give me eternal life. Let's think about that this morning, okay? Let's think about on our paper today. This is our negotiation sheet with God. If you were going to earn eternal life, uh, what would you write on this sheet? Don't get all spiritual on me and go to the end of the message. Just, just be honest. What would you write on the sheet? What do we typically write? Go to church. Is that one? You're here, so obviously that's something you value, and I'm so glad. Uh, possibly read the Bible. What do you think? Once a week is good enough? You know, okay, God, I'll just, I mean, we're, we're earning this, so yeah, sure, why not? We go to church a couple times a month, you know. I'll open the Bible once in a while, you know, a verse or two before I go to sleep. That's good. And, and uh, uh, what else might I do to inherit eternal life? Let's see. I, I can do good deeds. I'll, I'll go volunteer somewhere, and once in a while I'll do a good deed. Then I'll give up something that I, I shouldn't do, you know. Maybe I'll just drink less, or maybe I, I won't go to this place. or You know, so we can, we can write this whole list, kind of a contract, and say, okay, God, here, here's my list here. So, so I'm willing to do all this. Is the list pretty well good? You think we're pretty well in line with what most people would think? Yes, no, indifferent. Are you with me today? Okay. Uh, we got a list here, and we're just going to kind of hold it up to God and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm willing to do all these things. And your list may even be better than mine. You may put go on a mission trip. I mean, you are super duper you're going above and beyond. I mean, if God won't let you in heaven after a plane trip somewhere, what kind of God is this? I don't know about y'all, we laugh at this, but when I'm going through a hard time, I want to remind God of all the stuff that's on my list. My list is longer than some of yours. And there are times that I go through something that I don't like, that's very uncomfortable and unfair. And I'm like, hey, God, you, you seen this here? 
I'm a preacher. I deal with your sheep. And sometimes they bite. We talk every day. Your book, I read it all the time. Can you not give me a break? Haven't I earned a little better than I'm getting? Why is grandma sick and I prayed for her? And it's not happening. I've earned this. I've given you, I know it sounds stupid, but I've given you so much. Aren't you paying attention to the list that I've written? So many people serve a God that is transactional. Their relationship with God is transactional. When you get into that mindset of earning God's love, your relationship with God is only going to be as secure as your behavior on any given day. You're going to have days that you mess up. Come on now, let's just be honest about it. Let's not float around in the clouds today. You've got days when you're just better than others. You've got days when you feel more like a Christian. You've got days when you act more like a Christian. And you've got days when... You're not sure what's going on. You have times when you're more susceptible to temptation. There are times that you're just grouchy. There's times that you give, then you go through seasons, you feel stingy. I mean, you guys probably don't, but I do. Y'all look so sanctified this morning. that. Uh, but if you're like me, there are days that I don't do as well as other days. And if I live in a transactional mindset with God, that my relationship with Him, that His love for me is based on me earning it, my relationship with God is incredibly insecure and unstable. I'll go around about half my life thinking that God is mad at me because I've let Him down. This was the mindset of this young man. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Any of you watch the movie Sound of Music? How many like musicals? How many think that musicals are just would-be good movies, but they stop and sing all the time? <laughs> yeah, I know. My wife and I love Fiddler on the Roof. We love the Sound of Music. There's a song in Sound of Music when, uh, if you don't know the story, Maria comes to the home of, of Captain Von Trapp and is taking care of his many children and and uh, she's come to try to find herself you know and figure out if she wants to commit to the life of a of a nun or not and so uh, she goes to the house and these kids are just driving her crazy but something's happening and you see she's falling in love with the captain and he's falling in love with her and they're just not admitting it, it it's getting good now right it's like <laughs> it was so beautiful uh and they're they're there and then finally one night they're out on the the, the, what is that thing, uh, like a glass gazebo sort of thing, they're out there, and all of a sudden they realize they love each other, and of course they break into a song. And the name of the song is, I Must Have Done Something Good. And the whole idea is, because I found you, I must have done something good in my childhood to earn this. That's the mindset of much of the world. That if I can just be good enough and do good enough, somehow at that point, God will love me. Somehow, I will earn his love. So if you want to write out all the things that you're willing to do for God and hold it up to him, you can do that this morning. But it's not going to work. There's another thing the young man did. He went on, verse 19, Mark 10, 19, it says, but Jesus answered his question, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. Here are all the rules. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Jesus lists the commandments that are on the second tablet. If you were with us during our Ten Commandments series, the second tablet has to do the first tablet the one tablet has to do the first one with your relationship with God. The second 
tablet, your relationship with your fellow man. So Jesus lists the commandments on the second tablet to the young man, talking about his relationship with his fellow man. He said, uh, keep these commandments. And the young man replied, verse 20, teacher. Now notice he dropped the good. I think that's pretty funny. He's like, uh, that good word really ticked Jesus off the last time, so I'm not calling him good teacher anymore. I'm just going to call him teacher. He says, teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I've done it. Interesting thing, that the different, uh, there are three synoptic gospels in the New Testament. Synoptic gospel means three men wrote synopsis of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the three guys often record different perspectives on the stories. They're not contradictions. They're different perspectives that they saw. I think that actually uh, gives weight to the scriptures, that they each give their own unique perspective. Uh, Matthew 19, 18, the, man, the young man said this. Matthew heard this, and he put it down. The young man, when he mentioned the commandments, he said, Which ones? Which ones? Don't you love these folks? Which ones do I have to keep? And which ones are you let slide just a little bit? Kind of like all the guys around, if you remember the story. If you don't, Jesus is telling them one time, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he's talking about how we are called to love our neighbors. And they said, well, who is my neighbor? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the story of the rich young ruler shows us an attempt of the enemy in our lives to pull us into ethical conundrums rather than walking in simple obedience to the command of Jesus. We're going to see a little bit today and a lot over the next two weeks that following Jesus is pretty simple, that it's not complicated, that there aren't a lot of ethical conundrums. We make it much more complicated than it is. We make it complicated because there are times we're just trying to dodge. Now, I, I'm not throwing this at you. I'm with you. I've been there. I've done that. The thing you got to like about the young man is at least he's asking Jesus to write on the paper now. Right? Okay, good teacher. Okay, well, no, that makes... Okay, teacher... If, if that's not going to work, just, just tell me, uh, why don't you just write on the paper? So let's just send our papers up to God now. And why don't we just ask him to write a list of demands for us on our contract. And then we'll send it back down and, and we'll review the contract and decide if we're going to sign it or not. That sounds a little better. right at least we're letting God write on the paper now at least we didn't write it but don't you see what's happening this this young man has gone from an earner to a bargainer now he's like us he's negotiating with God he's trying to pull the price down as low as he can so he says okay tell me everything you want me to do and then send it back down to me and, and I'll figure out if I'm willing to do that or not wouldn't that be wonderful if God would just send us a contract? I'm just going to tell you right now, if God had written in the contract when I came to Jesus and told me everything that was going to happen to me, I would have had a hard time signing that. Because it hasn't all been easy, it hasn't all been wonderful. There have been some difficult times that I honestly don't know if I'd want to walk through again. I can tell you, I've never regretted saying yes to Jesus. There have been times in the midst of storms when I wondered, what in the world have you done? But I can say I'm so happy that I can look back on my life and say that he saved me, that he changed me, that he gave me life, that he called me to himself, and that I've walked with him now for a long time, and I'm so thankful that I did. But honestly, if he'd given me the whole picture and let me decide, I'd have kept negotiating. Okay, yes, Jesus, let's, let's cut out item 10 there. That period of time wasn't so good. That lady over there on the front would have taken item 10 out too. 
And we went through it together. Jesus lists the commandments, and some struggle with this, saying, well, was Jesus saying you can be righteous by keeping the commandments? No, when you go to the end of the story, you'll see that Jesus was just taking this young man on a journey because he knew where the young man's confidence laid. His confidence laid in the fact that he'd kept them all. Verse 20, Jesus lists all these, and, and, and then he says, Teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I did it. Hurrah. The contract signed. I've checked all the boxes. I've done everything you want me to do. So I must have eternal life. He's now bargaining with Jesus. When he said, I've, I've obeyed these since I was young, Jewish men uh, on their 13th birthday experienced the bar mitzvah, which is still active today. Bar mitzvah means son of the divine law. That on their 13th birthday, they become accountable to God to keep his law. And he's saying, since I was a young man, since I entered into that covenant with you, I have kept all the rules. If it's true that keeping all the rules gives you life, why is he still running to Jesus asking for life? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to just to make up all our own rules and say that's how you serve God? You can do that. It's called religion, and there's a bunch of them out there. You can take your pick. How many religions are there? How many different faiths are there? I heard a guy tell me this once. He said, well, I go over here to this church because they'll let you do this. He said, they'll let you drink a beer over there, so that's where I go. And this is a long time ago. Now, they'll let you go to dances over here at this church, so I go over here. There's all kind of religions, and people sign up for all of them. I heard a statistic, a statistic yesterday that shook me to my core, and uh, just wonder how many believe Henderson County is really a religious place? How many believe we're, we're pretty religious? You see the churches everywhere? How many can drive by? How many drove by 15 churches to get here this morning? We tend to think Henderson County is a very religious place. I heard a, a stat yesterday. Notice I didn't try to say statistic again. I heard a stat yesterday. It really shook me up. There are about 115,000 people in Henderson County. How many of those do you think claim no faith at all? The last census, just a couple back, and this shook us as a staff. We heard this stat yesterday. Over 53,000 people in Henderson County say, I have no faith. I'm unaffiliated with any church or with any religion. The census calls it unclaimed. We've got work to do. We've got work to do. Next time somebody tells me our church is getting too big, I'm going to say 53,000. Thanks for the amens. Religion is our effort to bargain with God. God, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do the other. And here's the, here's the deception when you write your own rules and check all the boxes, you can get a false sense of security in, your, in a religion of your own making. See, this mindset of negotiating with God is bad when you don't keep it. It's even more deadly when you do keep the rules. Because now you've earned it. Now God owes you something. Now everything you get is not from the hand of a gracious, loving, heavenly Father, but it comes to you because you deserve it. The Pharisees were that way. And Jesus had some harsh words for them. Harsh words. He said, you guys get a hold of somebody and give them all your rules and all your laws, and when you get done, they're twice the devil they were when they met you. That's what religion will do to you. That's what this negotiation, this transactional mindset with God will do in your life. If eternal life for you is based on the things that you have done and are doing or the rules that you are keeping, you're in a dangerous situation because that is not following Jesus Christ. So what do I do with this paper? 
why did you hand all these papers out? You know, we're still going to use it a little differently. Maybe you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. It's a powerful movie. It's really uh, kind of disturbing. I heard a veteran of war describe it to me as the most realistic uh, war um, movie he'd ever seen. Uh, one veteran actually told me he had to leave the theater when it was going on because of the sound of the bullets and all was so real to him he had to leave and it's a it's quite a disturbing movie in a lot of ways but it has this powerful message private ryan all his brothers had been had been killed in the war several i think there were like four of his brothers that had died so the army decided to send the army rangers to go and rescue private ryan and to go find him, to bring him home so that his mother wouldn't lose the whole family, all her sons. So this group of uh, army rangers led by the captain, played by Tom Hanks, uh, went out to find this young man in the midst of battle. And there were several in the squad, probably six or seven or more in the squad, and they went out to find him. And over the course of the movie, one by one, these guys are getting killed. They're being lost. And finally, near the end, they find Private Ryan, and then they get pinned down in a battle in this one particular town, and, and more of the men die, and Private Ryan's being saved. And at the end of the movie, there's a very poignant scene where Tom Hanks has been wounded, and he's dying, and he's, I think he's leaning up against a Jeep, sitting down, and Private Ryan's standing over him. And, and the captain, played by Tom Hanks, looks up at Private Ryan and says, Earn this earn this then it flashes back to the young man as an old man and he's actually standing over the captain's grave and he goes to his wife and he says tell me I'm a good man tell me I've lived a good life tell me that I've earned that sacrifice I heard an army ranger talk about that movie and he said I love the movie but the scene is not right he said, an army ranger would never, never have said, earn this. He said, because the motto of the rangers is sua spont. In Latin, it means of his own accord. Let that soak in you for a minute. What he's saying is, a ranger saves lives and puts his life on the line by his own accord by his own choice and would never say you have to earn this he would say I chose this John 10 17 and 18 Jesus said I lay down my own life I make the choice to give my life for the world I love it. Only Jesus can say this. He said, I lay down my own life and I'll pick it up again. That's my Savior. That's my King. That's my Lord. Jesus is never going to look at you and say, earn this. He would say, I chose you. And I chose to die for you. Even when you were in sin, the Bible said, he died for the ungodly. Even when there was no promise of, of a reward, even when there was no indication that you would serve him or follow him, Jesus said, I chose this. All the religions of the world can be defined by the word do. Do more. Do better. Try harder. It's all about do, do, do. Christianity is defined by the word done. Done. I don't live to please God by what I'm doing. I live out of what all has already been done for me by Jesus Christ. If you're an earner today, I want you to hear me. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he already has. There's nothing you can do to destroy his love for you. 
has loved you with an everlasting love. And I want to invite you this morning. Now, you may be a part of this church for a long time. You may have called yourself a Christian for a long time. But maybe today is the turning point in your life when you realize, I'm not earning this anymore. My behavior does not justify me before God. It doesn't give me eternal life. And it certainly won't make me a disciple. I simply have to rejoice in what's already been done for me and receive it into my heart by faith and live the rest of my life rejoicing in what's been done for me rather than what I can do for God. I went home last night and my wife was playing a song. Passion has a new song out and it's talking about God and it says, Bigger Than I Thought. Anybody heard that song yet? It's pretty new. It's pretty new, right? Uh, how many have heard that song, Bigger Than I Thought? Several of you already. There's a line in here that says, in the song that says, I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. I don't live in a transactional relationship with him because the price has already been paid for me. Jesus simply said to the young man, follow me. See, the key is not to earn favor with God. You can't. The key is not to bargain with God. The key is to surrender to God and follow Jesus. Go where I go. Walk where I walk. See what I do. Say what I say. And in the New Testament, it's even more powerful. When Jesus died and rose from the dead, he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. You see, the Jesus inside of you is more powerful than the Jesus beside of you. The Jesus in you will live through you. And your job is to surrender to his overwhelming love. Some of you still want to know what to do with this paper. This is a contract with God. Here's what you do. You get out your pen. This paper may go with you for a long time. You may keep it in your Bible. You may hang it on your refrigerator. But here's what you do. You take a blank sheet. You sign your name at the bottom. And you say, here you go, God. Write whatever you want on it. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you stop, I'll stop. What you say, I'll say. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. You surrender. Not a list of rules. Isn't that wonderful? I don't have to read the rule book. Oh yeah, read the Bible, but don't read it as a rule book. Don't read it as ten things I can do to make God happy. I'm simply following Jesus. Next two weeks, we're going to talk about what surrender to Jesus really means. But I want to invite you today to bow with me, and we're going to pray together. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus.